Hey everybody, Jeff here, uh, Fuller Embroidery Works, and I'm joined by Mr. Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios. We are both with the Embroidery Nerd. And today we've got a really fun subject. I don't know if Justin remembers what it is. I didn't remember what it was till like 20 minutes before we started. <laughs> Pretty much. But at least we decided it yesterday, sort of. This is true. Um, so today we're going to be talking about underlay. And unless if I am incorrect, then that's what we're going to be talking about. That's what I put in the uh, the header of the video. So if you guys do have questions, embroidery related or semi-embroidery related, go ahead and ask them in the comments and we will pull some up here to answer. But basically we are coming out with underlay. So there are a few different reasons that we use underlay. Um, Justin's going to correct me when I say wrong things here, but the first one is to support the upper stitching. Uh, basically we want to make sure that we're laying down a nice foundation for that stitching to st sit on top of. The second thing that we would be using it for is to marry the stable, the fabric to the stabilizer. Correct. And Justin didn't disagree with any of those things. So I'm going to assume that they may be, may or may not be correct. No. And... Are there more than that, Justin, or is that just it? I think there's just variations of those two things depending on the, the stitch type and the material type. But yeah, it's it's pretty much uh, those two things. It's, it's on how you use it. And how you use it. So mm -hmm. depending on the application, apparently, right. um, we're going to use underlay differently of what we are sewing on based off the fabric type. So I'm going to grab some comments in here because I see them coming up. We have Valentina. Hello, Jeff. Hello. We have Mr. Frank Dunn, the man that never sleeps. Good morning. Uh, we have Michael watching from League City, Texas. Uh, Valentine's from Bakersfield, California. We have Bebby Jean from up of Michigan. Hello. And we have Eric here. Underlay has been on my mind a lot lately myself, especially when working over textured substrates. Mm -hmm. And we have Jerry Lee, Ola Nerds, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I knew that one already. <laughs> but really, there's some there's some good articles out there. And one of them that I will refer you to, and I really should start like doing a links list thing. That might be a really good idea. I did not do it this time. But there are at least one or two articles I know of that Eric has written uh, that talk about underlay when you're building up on top of difficult substrates. Um, one of the more interesting substrates that I've been sewing on recently is actually, it is 350 GSM cotton woven fabric in a pearl weave. So for those of you that don't know what a pearl weave is, it is like corduroy, corduroy, but in both directions. So you end up with these little dots all over. It's kind of fuzzy, very thick, and a very interesting texture to deal with when you're trying to lay stitching down on top of it. Um, right. I used an edge run and a double zigzag. <laughs> <laughs> but really I was trying to lift up off of that and I use the edge run to help define the edge of the satin stitch. I use a double zigzag to help fill in so that I wouldn't have to use a very high uh, density on top. The problem when you're dealing with something like that is it is a fairly delicate fabric. It's, it's an interesting fabric. It's extremely rugged, but it does not like needle penetrations in it. Um, and in doing that, I was able to embroider it successfully without it pulling apart. And that was the big problem that I ran into. I can tell you, honestly, it's what judo, jujitsu, and aikido geese are made of. I almost said that wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an extremely durable material, but it does have that really kind of a waffly texture to it that you need to sit on top of or else your stitches are going to sink in and you're going to get problems with uneven edges, what it looks like. You get kind of a feathered look on the edge of the satin stitch. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll pull up a couple more comments here. We have Letty. Hey, guys. Hello, Letty. We have Veronica. Hi from Charlotte. Hello. And we have the other Campbell in the comments, Martin Campbell. Hello, sir. So 
So yeah, I think I think people uh, when you're having problems with density on your top stitches, whether it be fill or satins, uh, the the misconception is just to hammer it with more density, and that way you're not going to have the fills that are that are showing through the material or the or the satins that have that kind of zipper effect where it's it's jagging on the edges and and it's a I think it's a it's an even balance of getting the right underlay to support the top stitches to to uh kind of support where those those bigger stitches are might open up and, and show the bottom material um it's a matter of not just hammering of density but getting the right underlay getting the right stitch lengths getting the right density and those in combination are going to get you your best result like you said you're dealing with a, a material that may not take stitching very well so i think the balance of of that underlay with not so much density in the top stitching that's where you can kind of fine tune things when you're when you're dealing with especially materials that are a little bit different so let me ask you justin how would you have handled this differently than i did i mean i I'd, I'd, I'd have to see the design but it sounds like for what you did for you know not hammering that top density um on something like that i i'm not too familiar with that material but it sounds like it's it's not super thick where that if you did turn up the density on the satin it, it could still kind of handle it um but yeah trying to get that structural underlay to stabilize the material give a base for that top stitching and then the coverage is good on top uh you're doing all that by kind of lightly layering lightly structuring that those satin stitches so you're not bombarding that material with so many dense stitches on the top stitch so sounds like it probably the same approach something like that i probably have to experiment with to tell you the truth i mean if you see a fabric that you've never worked with before hopefully if you have some extra or you sit there with your hand on the stop button in case something goes wrong really quick i can honestly tell you that every time uh somebody i know that has one of these geese they rip a hole in it which it always fails on the embroidery they direct embroider them before they put them together. It always fails on the embroidery. Um, whenever somebody rips a nice big hole in there, I say, can I have it? <laughs> and they look at me kind of funny. I bring it home and I cut it up and I use it as swatches because it is, it is a very difficult material mm -hmm. to cover. Um, and it is just, it's a really weird texture and a kind of a different weave. It's not something that we see very often here. And I've looked to buy this material before. The only place I can buy, buy it is from Pakistan or China where they make it and I have to ship in a container full. Mm. They sell it for like three bucks a pound, <laughs> which I'm not well, a yeah. customer pound. You start running into that. That's, that's probably a good time where you start asking yourself maybe, you know, especially if you're dealing with a, something large back or, or a heavy density design, you say, all right, let's, let's put all these stitches into a patch. And then it's just one stitch around to put it on the on the gi. So um, that's that's one way of just ah. There you go, Eric. There you go, um, Eric. It sounds like a good idea for a patch. Um, and it is. These are actually they're patched quite frequently. Um, they're trying to go more with direct embroidery, and I don't know if they do it mainly to get the material to run out a little faster so that they can resell these things or if they're just moving away from the patches because you run into problems with the patches when you go to competitions. So in competitions, they actually specify that you have to have cotton patches. They have to be made of cotton hmm. with cotton thread. <laughs> and so wow. it's something that's not very common anymore. You don't necessarily see that written in a rule set where they say you can't use a material that is, uh, in my opinion, superior based off of what you're using it for. But that's why you don't see a lot of sublimation on that type of stuff is because it does specify in competition rules that you can't use that. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm going to go ahead and shamelessly plug Eric's patch class. If you guys didn't take it, I don't know if they have the replay up for sale, but it was a really good class. It was like four hours. I pretty much call it a TED Talk on <laughs> patches. It was, it was pretty good. Um, so you might want to check that out. And then also we did a webinar with Lee Caroselli from Balboa Threadworks on shading and blending. And the techniques that she uses very much mirrors in what you want to do with underlay. She's, she builds up in layers as she's moving up 
to stop show through and to help mix her colors as it goes. But when you start building in layers, you start getting interesting effects, which one of them would be less pull and push. Um, of course, that depends on the top, the top stitching that you're throwing down on top of that. Um, and Eric laughs. Welcome to my TED talk, folks. It, it was pretty good. It was, it was very, very good. It was long. I was not expecting it to be that long, but I sat through the whole thing. And we have a comment here. Cotton thread machine embroidery is cool looking, but can be a pain. Bermalana coal is rough sometimes. And for those of you that don't know, Bermalana is a thread that Madeira makes. It is, I what is it, 12 weight thread? I don't know if you've used it before, but it's 12 weight thread. And it goes, um, you have to run it through a size 100 needle. You get a very hand sewn look with it. There's some really cool stuff you can do with it with brushing it. But I'm starting to get way off topic here because you let me <laughs> talk, Justin. And I will I will talk as long as there's awkward silence, I will talk. And we might have a lot of that. But we, Eric says recording will be available shortly, but not quite yet. Awesome. Looking forward to that. So... Let's talk about the different cut, the different types of underlay that we can use. We have edge run, center run, zigzag, double zigzag, tatami, double tatami. Throw some more in there if you can think of them. Well, the edge run works for both uh, satin and, and fill stitches. Uh, the tatami is basically a zigzag throughout the throughout the uh, the fill stitch that just goes kind of perpendic perpendicular to your top stitching, depending on the angle that you choose. Um, it's from there. I mean, those are pretty much your, you have your zigzag, your center walk and your edge run are the, are the basics and how you apply them and what your density is, is going to be really the change in it. And, you know, the density of your, of your tatami underlay, um, whether you're having it only one direction or you're going to cross hatch it and have it two directions. Um, that's, that's the variables that you need to really choose depending on the, on the garment that you're looking for. And, or if you're trying to work center out on hats or whatnot. Um, but I mean, typically the center run is going to be something that's a, a thinner element where it's not going to support so many stitches like a zigzag or a edge walk. So the center runs basically going right down the center of your, of your satin. Um, and it just gives you that not only is it stabilizing the garment to your to your backing um but you're also going to give that just that single stitch kind of a something those that satin to grab onto as it's going back and forth over that center walk um edge run basically it's like it, it sounds it's a stitch that kind of goes around just inside the the edge uh the contour of your satin stitches or your fill stitches uh typically it's just about a half a millimeter maybe a little less inset from the edge of the from the satin stitches um typically that's done with with elements that are a little bit wider uh and and it needs something on that at outer edge to kind of grab onto to stabilize or to to reduce that zipper effect on the outside where the stitches just want to fall into the fabric uh a lot of times when you get into the wider objects you start using tool two different um underlays like a, a zigzag along with a edge walk um i don't know if we want to pull up wilcom here and kind of we can while, while you start pulling up wilcom here i'm going to grab a couple comments we have michelle here okay. from Folsom, california and we have natalie from la so one of the more interesting things that i see online uh and i see it fairly often is if somebody's having trouble with, with lettering, particularly when you start getting into narrow columns, uh, the very, very common thing that you hear come out is uh, remove all the underlay. So right. in your professional experience, I'm going to put it that way, are there times that you would remove that? And if so, why and in what case? To remove it completely, I don't think is a good idea. Now, if you are working with, with really small lettering and you're relying on the software to choose the path and, and the stitch length of, of the underlay, you could run into problems because you're working in such a small area. Those computer generated stitches may stick out here and there. Um, also, if 
that, that's a case where I think you're going to be wanting to do it manually. You're going to want to you're on a plot your underlay manually using manual stitches or running stitches. Typically, small lettering you're going to be doing a center walk uh, underlay. Um, the only times I've really removed underlay completely is if I'm traveling throughout the design and I'm kind of going underneath satin stitches already with with travel stitches. Those are going to act as a center walk once it that top stitch goes over it. So instead of having a travel stitch on there from, say, an element that's 15 elements before and then go back over it with another underlay, you're doubling it up. You're adding stitches. So those are times where I'll, I'll remove underlay. And it's it's maybe not even just saying removing underlay, but it's it's turning off the automatic underlay in the software because you're going to do it manually or there's something that's already kind of supporting that lettering. Oftentimes I see when people pull that out, you never really get rid of all underlay because there is, like you said, the traveling stitches. And a lot of right. times it's the traveling stitches that are actually causing the problems because as you're digitizing, you're laying out objects in Wilcom, you set, and in these cases, I'm talking about hats. <laughs> I mean, we won't sugarcoat it. Everybody knows I'm talking about hats, but you set your, manual you set your underlay stitch length at let's say one and a half millimeters but your traveling stitches are still set at two and a half or three millimeters and so your underlay runs down and then as it goes to travel back you're jumping the two and a half to three millimeters around the corner and now you're in a, right. introducing the harder or i guess less of a curve where your satin stitch is going down left to right it's eventually going to kick that on the outside of it Right, right. Because if you're if you're if you're doing your underlay manually, um, you know your brain's gonna think, okay, I'm traveling from here to here. But that also can be the underlay. The software is gonna say, all right, let me do all the underlay that I'm supposed to do. Do one part, and then I'm gonna travel. So those are those settings are different. The underlay setting is is one value when the travel stitches are another. Uh, when you're plotting it yourself, you can say, okay, I'm going to travel, which that stitch is going to also be my underlay, you know, do this element and then travel and, and so on and so forth. One of the more interesting things that I see with that too, is that you can tell when a design, they manually plot their underlay versus when they let the machine do it. And oftentimes if you remove the machine or the auto generated underlay and you manually plot it, you're going to come up with a lower stitch count. Right. Um, the downside, I mean, I guess it's a trade-off really is you have, you can either go with the lower stitch count and spend significantly more time digitizing it, or you can let the, um, software do it. And now you've saved time digitizing, but you're going to pick up a little bit of time on the production run. Um, I guess that really guess <laughs> depends on the number of garments you're going to be doing. Right. And yeah, I, I don't think necessarily i mean unless there's a ton and ton of lettering that you're doing manually um i don't think it's going to to increase the stitch count detrimentally if you use the the automatic underlay um on larger lettering i pretty much use the automatic underlay i think it works well especially from wilcom the smaller lettering is where i i kind of go in there and do it myself um but yeah i mean it's, it's one of those things where, again, you, you can digitize what, you, what needs to be done to get a quality design, even if you have a software that has no automatic settings at all. You can do all these type of stitches yourself using manually manual and running stitches. You can produce these. but um, I mean, yeah, oftentimes that's the difference between a lower tier of a software and the upper tier is lower right. tier, you have to do almost everything manually in the upper tier, it it includes those tools right. that make it happen faster and easier. Um, I do have a comment here from Cindy. She says, I was trying to increase my underlay to try and cover my background color while putting a light colored lettering on top. It didn't work, I just had to increase my satin stitch. And I mean, this is something that you have to look at. It, it is a holistic approach, like Eric says. Um, if you're trying to cover a really dark colored garment or a bright colored garment with really light thread, you're going to get show through and you can increase your underlay to help offset that. But ultimately you're still going to have to increase your density a little bit to get the coverage that you need. Right. Uh, versus if I was doing like on a light gray shirt, I was running white thread. There's a good chance that I can lighten things up, 
because it is light and shadow that you're dealing with and you're not going to necessarily see that show through that you get on some of those colors. Right. And Eric says, when I underlay manually, I do so when I need to swing the underlay to deal with areas where it pulls to a side under stress or bridges areas where lettering strokes separate add junctions. That was a lot of words. I only understood half of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what he was talking about. <laughs> I, it I, is, understood. I understood. It is late and I've had a drink or two and it's only 8.30 here. So you, you have not had a drink or two. I didn't say what I drank. Oh, okay. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, I do not drink alcohol. Uh, unlike Justin, who's got rum and Coke in that glass, I'm pretty sure. Just no, Coke? Just water. Water. Man, we definitely need to uh, spice this thing up. At least get one of us half drunk. It's a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Eric says it helps if I spell. It would help me. At. Now I understand what you were saying. Uh, little okay. pieces, Little bits and pieces here. So. Let's go ahead and pull up. Justin's got his software on deck here and let's take a look at some of the different underlay options. And Will, I think that it would be best if we just looked at, let's say satin stitches and kind of broke down um, on a satin stitch. At what point do you need to start changing your underlay options versus center run to moving to maybe an edge run and then moving to an edge run with a zigzag. Um, Kind of go over those different areas as where you're going to need those. All right. So, you know, if you have a thin satin here, uh, let's see. Right now it's at just about two and a half tall. Uh, something like this would definitely, you go into your your underlay settings. And with Wilcom, it gives you a, a first underlay and a second underlay. So you can add the, the two different underlays to the to the to the item or to the element uh something like this i would say depending on the garment you're going with anything under three millimeter i typically use a center walk what uh what do you usually do jeff so we have to preface this with i do a lot of sewing on twill okay. <laughs> and by a lot i mean a lot so at three millimeters i'd still be on an edge run um i know when i move into like performance garments uh, I'll start going with just a center walk on that because I know that it's going to pull in a little bit and um, I don't want to have the issues of the underlay kicking out or all the other issues that you can run into with that. Right, right. Yeah, again, these are these are kind of general uh, rule of thumbs for these, these settings. Um, the, the, the change of garment style and type is definitely going to kind of change your, your view of underlay kind of like Edge run on hats, uh, rule of thumb for me, I never use an edge run on a hat. Uh, when you're dealing with that, that curved surface of a hat and you have a lot of shifting and a lot of uh, areas that, that aren't perfectly on registration, uh, the edge run is going to be something where you're going to see those, those little loops on the outside that you see on satins that you see some people having an, problems on hats. So rule of thumb like i said i never use a, a, an edge run on uh on a hat so uh but again these are these are just kind of rule of uh, general rule of thumb i'm going to change the density on this to lighten up just so you can kind of see the underlay underneath uh so we have this nice zigzag stitch yeah so if you if you imagine this is a this is a full satin that that center run is is like it's like it's called it's a either a center run center walk depending on what software uh, Wellcom uses center run the length of the stitch is going to be a a factor that you can program into the software uh, the variable run is is, is basically um, the length of of the short stitches when it turns corners uh you can set that that if you are you set it too high and you have the, the stitching too too long there is points where going to, around a curve you might have part of the underlay sticking out so that's where you kind of adjust that that value there to to help going around curves 
So uh, one thing to keep in mind with that is that value can be very software specific. Some software does not have that short stitches values and you have right. to take that into account when you're setting your upper stitch length. Um, or your, or your stitch length on your center run itself. Yep. If, if you don't, if you don't have that value or you don't have that capability in your software, you may have to shorten that center run stitch length in order to get around those curves without that, those longer stitches sticking out. Um, when you start getting into the wider satins, um, that's when you start getting into areas where you do a zigzag or double zigzag. I wish we could change the upper stitching to a different color than the underlay. Here, let's do this. Well, I guess you could just do that. Turn that off. I guess you're still going to see the, the satin on the other one. Eh. Gives you a good idea. So I'm going to I'm going to pull a comment here. Eric says some software can also do that shortening without allowing you to set that short length as well. It's worth looking over. Yeah. Know what your software can do and work around those limitations. Right. Uh, so a zigzag is what it's called. It's, it's a zigzag stitch that goes underneath. Um, when you, when you have something like that on a wider satin, it's going to give kind of that structural element underneath that satin because those stitches are so long. It just, it's kind of giving you a, another layer of stitches that's going to help raise off that. It's going to help uh, any separation that you get in the top stitches. You're going to have that other layer of, of a light satin underneath that, that gives it structure. Um, when you're getting into satins that are quite a bit wider, you'll go to a double zigzag and maybe even add a edge run. As you can see, it's kind of going around the edge of that, that satin. Um, that's just really... You start getting into really wide satins. You you want to increase your density a little bit because that's when you have that that effect where you can kind of run your finger down the satin and it's going to start separating. Um, if you have that structural bottom where it's giving you that that outside uh, edge run, so the the outside of that satin can grab onto something, as well as that double zigzag underneath. Again, it's it's almost like doing two layers of a satin to to give it that bold dense look but the bottom layer is, is going to be a lot less dense because it's only that, that zigzag underlay. Um, use this a lot also when you're, when you're dealing with uh, really uh, dense or, or textural elements like towels and stuff like that where you're going to have that pile that really wants to just come up through the top stitching. You kind of nail that, that material down first you, you pack it down so those top stitching are gonna are gonna sew normally over it. Um, I believe they call that in hatch. It's a hatch smash, and in in brilliance, it's knockdown. And in E four point five, it's called just a light density fill over the top of it. Right. Well, the the knockdowns and stuff like that is it, that's a little bit different. That's when you take a whole area and kind of knock it down with that underlay type stitch where it's not a full fill. Um, but that's when you take like the whole area around the, and behind the design and, and knock it down. Um, but in essence, this is kind of doing the same thing, but you're isolating it only underneath your top stitching. So same, same, uh, same outcome as far as trying to get that material down. Uh, other than that, I mean, there's times where you may want to choose just an edge run where you're not dealing with too much of a, of a wide satin and, and you're not dealing with a material that needs to have that much structural underlay. Um, again, too much, too much stitches sometimes is, is, is not a good thing when you're dealing with certain fabrics. Um, the, again, the, the, the edge run is basically giving that support to the outsides of your, of your satin stitch. It's not going to really do anything as far as going down the center of your of your satin stitch. Um, that's where uh, if you are dealing with, like you said, when you're dealing with uh, twill materials, something that's even at three millimeters, um, because of that particular material kind of gives you, it's almost like a center center run underlay, but that's just, it's doubled, of course, and it's yep. just a little bit wider than that center run. So it's kind of giving you 
dual center run that's offset a little bit. So, I mean, you know, one of the good. things you have you really have to watch for when you start getting really really narrow is there's a factor that's not often brought up um, when talking about this kind of stuff, and that is your needle blade width. So a 7511, um, for those of you guys that don't know, the 7511 that we really commonly use in embroidery, the measurement of the, um, the needle at the blade of the needle is 0.75 millimeters. So if we look at that, when we start talking and you start seeing people trying to do satin stitches under a millimeter, right? The problem that you're running into is now as your needle comes up, it moves over to go to the other side and it comes down. The problem that can happen is, is because it's so narrow, the needle's going to drop in the same hole. Depending on the material, it can deflect back into the exact same hole. And now you have a stitch that when it tries to form, it sucks down inside of the hole and you can cause issues running on your machine. Right. Um, and that's something that's not very commonly talked about when, when underlay is discussed. And it's something that always pops into my mind when people are like, well, pull the underlay out. Because at least if you have a center run underlay underneath that, if it drops in the same hole, you still have something there for it to sit down on top of. I'm not gonna right. say it's ideal and that you should be doing uh, <laughs> satin stitches that narrow, but we basically, as embroiderers and digitizers and uh, hobbyists, <laughs> or we do this for a living, we work off of the limitations of the embroidery machines and the thread that we're using and the needles that we're using. Right. Those are our hard limitations. Now there's a lot of general like rules of thumbs. Um, you're gonna get a lot of weird answers when people aren't quite sure when you're talking about. If you, if you go out there and you say, hey, what underlay do I use? I'm trying to sew this design on a shirt. It's like, okay, that's almost the information I need because we do need to know what type of shirt. Is it a loosely woven t-shirt? Is it a dry fit polo? Is it a, uh, I'm trying to think of what the, what the weave is, but it's like a tightly woven, like almost dress jackets, like what you see on chef coats, lab coats, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. You know, all of those, they have different characteristics that are gonna make them hold up better or perform worse depending on the, the decisions that you make when you're creating the file. Um, right. But ultimately when we start getting really, really narrow, the needle blade width becomes an issue. And I know some people, I don't, I don't necessarily run stiffer needles, but like some people they'll move to an 8012, they'll move to a 9014 when they're working on a hat because they need that extra um, rigidity in the needle shaft. But now they've just introduced a different element into their design that now that needle is gonna make a larger hole. And so when you're trying to work on smaller elements, it can be an issue. Um, right. I know Louise just did, he did a comparison where he sewed out a bunch of text and the only thing he changed was the needle size. I think he went down to like a 57 or 56, five zero slash six. Can't remember the size, but as he went down in needle size, the text got clear. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because now he's not punching as big of a hole. The fabric doesn't have to heal in as much of the hole and you get more precision out of what you're doing. Right. Um, so there are a lot of factors that play in when you're deciding on underlay. Now, typically with a hat, when I start going really, really narrow, I'll do like a one and a half millimeter uh, stitch length that's moving forward uh, for underlay. I'll do, if it, if it starts to get wider, I'll do a zigzag. And then if it gets even wider, I'll do a double zigzag. I don't typically do edge run underlays on hats, mainly because you run into that shifting issue where it pops out. I believe you could do a further inset. I've never done that. I've just always done a zigzag. So there is an inset of uh, the width of the zigzag? Yeah. Um, but again, with hats, most of hats are made out of a tightly woven twill. <laughs> right. So twill holds up stabilizer really, or holds up the stitches really, really well. You introduce the buckram that's added to the structured front, and now you've got a really nice stable flat that you're going to be throwing stitches down on top of, which is why you can get away with some things like increased density for 3D puff versus like I wouldn't run 3D puff on a t-shirt. 
<laughs> I would expect to have lots and lots of holes torn in it if I ran that on a t-shirt, but on a tightly woven twill, now you've just changed the type of material that you're sewing on. You've changed the characteristics of what you need to do to be successful sewing that out. And I can see Justin's changing something or other on his screen. I think he's going to pull it back up here. <laughs> yeah, I was just adding happy. it. I was adding a fill stitch here just so we can. Oh, sure. Over. That was a horrible pick. Make people look at me. <laughs> uh, getting into the underlays of, of a fill stitch. Uh, again, that's just light density so you can see through it. Um, it's the most common are the, tat the tatami which is, again, it's going to run perpendicular to the top stitching to kind of give you that, that definitely that structural support. So all those fill stitches are going to sit on top of the, the underlay instead of sinking into the, to the material. Um, the other thing it does is it puts the pull underneath. It helps offset the pull on the top because now you're pulling in one direction. And when your stitches come across the top, they're going to pull in the opposite direction. Right, right. And yeah, and there's there's times where, um, you know, typically, you know, it's the heavier or the, the more difficult material that you're trying to get coverage on, y y people have the tendency to say, okay, you know, something like a towel or a robe, you're going to get hot, you're going to have, have higher densities, you're going to have more underlay, because you're really trying to fill in those areas that 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 weave of the robe or the towel is going to want to show through. Um, at the same time, like you said, when you're dealing with things that are pulling like dry fit polos, um, it's, it's kind of going against what you would kind of knee jerk do and thinking to myself, okay, I don't want as many stitches on this polo. You actually want a double tatami where it gives you that mesh because what that's going to do is, you, you know, of course, you're not going to want a really, 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 really high density underlay, but giving that mesh on that material is going to really, really uh, secure your material so it's not pushing and pulling all over the place when you're doing your top stitching and your and your your fills or your outlines or your text coming going back and forth left and right on your shirt. So something like that, you, it's not always the more the heavier when you need it it's kind of the finesse of okay where where do i need to stabilize this material um you know something mesh like this that's that's gonna really grab onto that material and say hey this is the foundation this shirt isn't going to go anywhere and now do your top stitching and hopefully you know depending on your densities and your stitch lengths uh you're not going to get those extreme puckers you're not going to get uh uh, the push and pull that you'd get when you don't have the proper underlay. All right. I'm going to grab a couple comments here because this is Eric says, now, you know why I'm always making vector graphics for my slide decks on this. We're learning. <laughs> <laughs> and we have uh, Brian Bailey, uh, creator of Imbrilliant saying nerding out for the first time. Hi guys. Hello, Brian. Uh, Brian. The first time I've seen him, seen him join the, the cast here. So uh, it's nice to have you here. Um, so when you're working on, let's say you're going on a, just a regular lightly woven t-shirt, what are going to be the considerations that you're going to have when you're planning your underlay, your fills? Um, what, what are the things that you look at as a digitizer when you begin that process of saying, all right, I'm going to throw a big circle on here. This is what I need to make sure that that doesn't become a problem. Well, I, anything like that where you're dealing with it with a thinner material or, or a material that's not going to want to take a lot of stitches very well. Um, you know, the dry fit polos, the, the t-shirts, it's, it's kind of working in those layers that, that's, that's going to get you the best result. You, you don't want to, you don't want to, um, hammer the top stitches thinking, oh, okay, I, I need the coverage because I'm doing white you know, thread on a black t-shirt. Um, you're going to want to do a little bit longer stitch lengths on your fills. So it's really not pulling on that material. And you're going to really want to build that foundation up kind of like the one I just showed you on the, on the dry fit where it's kind of those, those lighter 
underlays uh, kind of going in all the, the opposite directions. So you're kind of um, stabilizing it saying, okay, you know, light underlay this direction, light underlay this, this direction, and then your opposite direction is going to be your fill. So you don't have so many same directions pushing or pulling uh, on that material. Um, so I, I'm going to interject a question here because I genuinely have it. When you're doing multiple fills like that, is there, do you want to path them out so that they sew from one side to the other, or do you want them to sew partially towards the middle and then jump, run over to the other side and sew back towards it? No, I, I try to make sure, and this is where you, if, if you're really working with a material that's going to get it kind of be temperamental in a way, um, when, when you have underlays, if you're not paying attention to where your start and stop points are, if you do use a, an automatic underlay in you know a software like Wilcom, you don't put the right start point, that, that underlay may start in this corner, work your way up, just run back to this corner and work your way in this way. And you, if you start having points of the underlay where it's, it's meeting in two places where they're kind of opposite directions, inwards and then inwards, you can possibly get buckling in that, in that material. So I think the best possible way is kind of that, that smooth path where you're going one point to another, then you can run or walk over to another area if you need to. Like if you're going from left to right corner, you walk over to the top, left uh top left to bottom right corner so you're not kind of having these these different underlay patterns coming in and meeting in, in weird places yeah definitely weird results when you do that uh i've seen a lot of people call it um and i and ramona did a video on this where she called it the pinch and that is where if you're throwing down fills and they're coming on a softer material you're actually you got to think of it kind of like a wave and you can see this on hats which is kind of fun but if you're moving from one direction to another, you're starting to push the fabric in that direction as it pulls in. You're pushing and you're creating a wave. And you can, if you're, if you're not careful, you get that wave tall enough, then you run around to the other side and you come back. Now you've got this, uh, Justin said it was buckling, um, but you, you get this like hump. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of fabric in there. And you're going to, of course, that's not going to be underlay. And then when you throw your top stitching down on top of that, because you've added or you've pinched in a textural element that has vertical lift to it, now when your fill, fill comes down over the top, it's going to stick out pretty bad. <laughs> right, right. And and you start throwing in uh, factors of of not hooping tight enough and that material is just that much, that, that much looser than it should be. Um, like you said, it's it's not just a matter of of that material maybe just kind of of kind of weirdly buckling where they meet, but you may have that pinch of you know a good millimeter or two of material because it's so lax in in the hooping and how tight it is that those those two points come together, pinch a piece of material. Now it's it's kind of rendering that that one line kind of non underlay, and now you're just coming over with the top stitching. That's why it's so important on hats to do a center out underlay no matter what. I, I, I try to go global underlay on hats as much as I possibly can to kind of, because if you if you watch a, a, uh, a fill that you plot onto a hat and you use automatic underlay, that underlay starting here, coming over here, coming over here, and just stop it before it even does the top stitching. And more than likely that center of that hat's kind of buckling up like that because you're not kind of laying it down, flattening it out, saying, all right, give me this, this flat surface to work with for the remainder of the design. Yep. So I'm going to pull a comment here. It's Eric. Uh, crashing the wave and stitching it down is the worst. I'm not <laughs> a fan of it. Um, I had early on in my embroidery career, I had this interesting design where it was a, of course, they had to go from back to front on the design, but the problem was, is the back was on the right panel about an inch and a half from the center seam. And the front was on the right panel about an inch and a half from the center seam. And so I had to start on one side and move over to the left side. And this is when I discovered, um, well, this is when I stitched my finger to a hat. We'll be honest. And that's when I started using um, chopsticks to hold that, but that was that was the problem I was having. As it was moving from the left panel over to the right panel, it was starting to do that wave. 
And then as it got a little bit past the center seam of the hat, that would crash over and it would literally stitch a fold in the hat. And this is a structured panel hat. So it's not just giving up that fold easily. It, it was something the machine had to work for. And sometimes, you know, you're stuck by the design that it just has to be that way. And there are things you can do to try to mitigate it. But in this instance, I was holding it down with a chopstick because I was trying to stop it from crashing. I was stop trying to stop it from raising up as it was stitching down. I essentially was giving it more stability in the center by pushing it down with a chopstick. Right. And I don't recommend that. <laughs> but I would use a chopstick over my finger any day because people laugh when you go to the emergency room with a hat stuck to your finger. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. Um, oh. that's, why, that's why on hats, like if you are dealing with, with something that has kind of individual elements where you can't do, uh, you know, a global underlay across the whole surface of the hat because you're going to fill it eventually or have elements on top of it everywhere. Uh, when you have those elements that are kind of sporadic through the hat, that's when you really need to pay attention to to the sequence of that you're doing things because if you so you know, this one that's a little bit left to this, uh, to this element here, and that's going to push your hat in just a hair this way, and this one's pushing hair that way, that's when you can get a lot of that buckling uh, that, like you said, hopefully resequencing can kind of take care of that, but sometimes it's just... I mean, ultimately, if we sew a small element to the right of the seam, and we sew an element, small element to the left of the seam, chances are that seam's going to push up a little bit. And then if we come down and we sew an element directly on top of the seam, now we push that down and we've got a bubble between both sides of the element. And now we try to sew over that. And one thing that we need to consider is when we are nailing these things down to the stabilizer is that if we get bubbles like that, when we go to smash that down flat, now we're putting excessive pressure laterally on the stabilizer and that's something that's made to be dimensionally stable. And it can cause your stitching to break free of your stabilizer right. um, when you're doing that. And there's what you have to do sometimes. <laughs> but if you can at all avoid it, ultimately, you're going to get a better stitch out. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, well, Justin, again, showing me on full screen here. Sorry. <laughs> Everybody likes to look at me. <laughs> so back to the fill options here. There's the uh, the edge run, of course, which pretty much, uh, generally speaking, the the most widely used is a combination between a tatami, which is the direct perpendicular stitch to your top stitching, and an edge run, and that kind of gives you that stability around the edge. So the the shape of your fill is not going to pull, pull in so much to, to, to distort the shape. So those are the two main ones that I use when it comes to fill. Um, there is the double tatami when you really need to, to structurally stabilize or push down that fabric and such things like, you know, robes and, and towels that we talked about. Um, zigzag under a fill i don't think i've ever used before i don't see a use case in which i would want to do that because no, generally your stitch length becomes longer than your top stitching right and this in the zigzag setting is basically the same direction left and right to to your fill so it's not giving any structural integrity uh as far as you know building that perpendicular bottom stitch it's kind of going the same direction i thought it's an odd you know choice, choice in 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 wilcom but i've never used it so unless anybody else can tell me that there's there's good use for it i don't think i ever will so well, maybe if you um, narrow it up so it looks like a satin stitch <laughs> maybe <laughs> so so one of the things too um, that you need to look at is your start stop points. You saw on, if Justin wants to pull his screen back up here again, you have that wonderful lateral line that's running down there to center. And chances are it's doing that because it's plotting the underlay and it's ending up 
across the way opposite of where it wants to throw the fill stitch. So it's adding in just a random run stitch in there to Correct. compensate for that. Now, one of the most um, evident designs that I've seen for that kind of an issue is when you're working with glow in the dark thread. And I don't know how often you do that, Justin, but when you path a glow in the dark thread design, um, you can do a full fill on top of it. And one of the interesting things is, is if you have any traveling stitches underneath, when you turn off the lights and that glow happens, you see the travel stitches through the glow fill. Hmm. <laughs> I did not know that. I know that because I've done a lot of it. And it's like, every time I do a glow in the dark design, I forget about it and I'll sew it out on my machine and I'll pull it off and I'll hit it with light and I'll turn off the lights. And there's my weird like half arc travel circle that will come through in there to get from point A to point B. Um, this does look like almost you have Trapunto on because it is traveling around the outside edges. Uh, I have an edge run on. Yeah, but you can set Trapunto too. So that means if it yeah. if can do any travels, it's going to run around the edges. No, don't have it on. Oh, I'm impressed that you were even able to find that in the myriad of <laughs> menus. But I, I was just demonstrating here, as you can see, like if you choosing different start and end points, because because this start point was, was set down here in this corner, and the fill direction is going to be at this angle here. It's going to want to start perpendicular to your fill. So it's going to actually walk over to that corner because I chose the start point over here to start that, that stitch perpendicular. So in that way, it's coming perpendicular to it. And this is actually where one of those little areas right there where you do have two pieces of area that come together uh where the underlay which not all materials are going to be affected by that um i think it's just one of those cases where if you are using a material that's really wanting to pucker um that's when you really want to just kind of plot your own underlay where you can choose exactly start here and here and you do the traveling yourself to make sure that there's no breaks in that in that underlay uh that the computer chooses and one of the things that you need to keep in mind, too, is that you can always take out the automatic underlay. A tatami fill or a tatami underlay is essentially a very open tatami fill. Right. So you can do a you can do two fills and one of them you open it up and set up the stitch angles as an underlay. And then the other one comes across the top as part of the fill on top. And now you're able to control every point that you're traveling to because you're manually setting that up versus letting the software do it. There's not a whole lot of times that I've needed to use that, but like glow in the dark thread, ultimately that's one of the times that I need to do that because any of the weird travels that it can throw in there that you normally wouldn't see on any other garment, it now becomes an issue and it's something that you have to compensate for and know about when you're doing your design on top. Right. Ironically, the first time I discovered that is when I was doing a three layer fill and I was putting my um, underlay, manually plotting my underlay between the second and the third layer of the fill for the mm. top satins. <laughs> it was an experiment. It worked, sort of. And then I hit it with glow in the dark thread and realized maybe I should have just put in more trims. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, but with that, unless if there's more that you wanted to talk about, Justin. No, I think that pretty much covers the, the basics of underlay and when and how to use them. Yep. So with that, I think we're going to end five minutes early. No bonus time for you guys today um, because you were really quiet in the comments. Should have asked more questions. <laughs> but with that, I'm going to run over some of the things that are coming up. Here on the 26th, uh, Justin's going to be doing his third 3D Puff webinar, uh, the advanced level, which is titled, do you remember? Advanced techniques, the wow factor. Advanced techniques, the wow factor. There you go. Um, so we have that coming up here on July 7th, which is a lot of time away, but I'm really, really excited for it. We're going to have Tree Teresa uh, from Wilcom and James from Wilcom as well on. 
and I'm looking forward to that interview. Uh, I'll be releasing more information about that ahead of time. Uh, this last Saturday, we did a webinar with Lee Caracelli from Balboa Threadworks on mm -hmm. shading and blending and part of that. So um, <laughs> whenever Lee does that, I, every time, every class I take from Lee, I pick up a little bit more information. Um, but it's definitely one of those things that I have to wrap my head around. Uh, so we've got that coming up here, coming up here pretty well, pretty soon yeah. as well. We have Fort Worth coming up. Um, we're going to be at ISS Fort Worth. So if you guys want to stop down and see us, that would be great. Uh, and other than that, did I forget anything, Justin? Uh, other than that, I mean, if you did miss Lee's, you could always uh, register and get the recorded version of it. Uh, I think it was an awesome webinar. Uh, I learned some stuff on blending that I've never used the techniques that she showed. So pretty awesome stuff with that. Also part one and two of my 3D puff webinars. If you haven't checked those out, it's probably a good idea to, to absorb that information before you see part three. Um, those are available as well on the recorded versions because um, part three is going to be pretty advanced compared to, to the other two. So um, check those out. There's links on in the group. If you can't find them, just let one of us know. We'll get we'll you those links. Yep. It's definitely one of those, the success for the successor builds on the, pre, the information of the previous one. So right. um, definitely you'll want to make sure that you catch at least number two before you go to number three. Number one was a little bit more how to run it and digitizing concepts. Number two was more into the digitizing of how to do it. And number three is going right. to be, the combination of those, but if you've already ran Puff before, I would definitely not miss number two before going to number three so that you get that kind of foundational information and you won't right. just be completely lost in number three. Um, exactly. But with that, that is Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios. I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works, and we are both with the Embroidery Nerd. Thank you guys for hanging out with us tonight. Thanks, guys. <laughs>